Uh, okay, so this is a lecture about logistics. Uh, it is broadly in conversation with the uh, philosophy of Fred Moten and Stefano Harney, who are two contemporary social critics and poets. Much of what you learn here can be not just about debate, but about your life and the way that you think about yourself and improvement and revision. Uh, I also think it's important broadly to think about theory as poetry instead of just as a thing that is a means to an end. And so I'd encourage you, if you decide to read their work, to watch some of the videos they have on YouTube, of which there are many, uh, also to kind of think about the way that it relates to your own life, because much of their work is poetry and storytelling. And the point is not to be completely abstract for the sake of abstraction, but the abstractness that exists in their philosophy is meant to make you think about how it relates to your, your own life. So to give some background, if I could, I would begin this lecture with the classics. Um, so Greek philosophy, particularly Plato and the Republic. Obviously, there's not time for this and most of you will get bored. But uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy or Wikipedia entry should suffice if you want background of that. So instead, I'm going to start with Enlightenment philosophy and a couple of crucial concepts that Moton and Harney use as foils for their critique of Western conceptions of rationality and humanism. The first is the social contract, which is a theory or model that originated during the Enlightenment and concerns the legitimacy of the authority of the state over the individual. So in the social contract, it argues that individuals have consented either explicitly or tac tacitly to surrender some of their freedoms and submit to the authority of a ruler or the decision of the majority or a government in exchange for the protection of their remaining rights. Uh, many of you have probably heard of the social contract in various European history courses or world history courses, follows with Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Kant, um, many of these kind of philosophers established the contemporary idea of Western governance, the notion that you must be willing to give up some rights in order to have others protected. Uh, it'll become clear, by the way, when I get into the Moton and Harney stuff, why I think that these are important concepts, but I'm gonna start with brief description. So the second is humanism, which is a philosophical belief that individual that emphasizes the individual and social potential and agency of human beings considers human beings as the starting point for any serious moral or philosophical inquiry. The third is the scientific method. So observation, skepticism, experimentation, analysis. Uh, and the fourth is a broad concept that I'll call the age of reason or positivism. Um, a lot of different perspectives here. One in particular is Descartes. Um, who argued that the mind and body are separate. There's the famous saying, I think, therefore I am. The idea of positivism is that every statement can be logically proven or disproven via the application of the scientific method to sociality or social sciences. So to get into Moton and Harney, uh, again, watch YouTube. There's kind of two key books that are read and cited in debate. The first is The Undercommons. The second is All Incomplete. Uh, also, a lot of their poetry is really beautiful, and I would encourage you to read some of it. Uh, why is this important? Uh, I think that it matters because the point of their philosophy is to teach us to think differently about what our goals in life should be and how we should relate to goal to broader struggles and ideas and one of the first is this notion of the antisocial contract which is well flushed out in all incomplete it is about the tyranny of improvement the antisocial contract is not only a political theory, but is also an economic practice. The practice of the juridical regulation and anti-socialization of exchange for the imposition of improvement. 
uh, they write that the antisocial contract is haunted by the economic contract, which is not a contract of exchange like one might find in friendship, but a contract based on the claim to ownership of oneself, others, and nature. And it is always tied to what more one can make of which is to say accumulate in and through oneself, others, and nature. In other words, the expanding universe of ownership took a contractual form that was not limited as it sometimes supposed to free individuals. That is to the European subject imagined by the European theorist, it is in a contractual form rather that requires broad spectrum contact as the material ground of its exclusive and exclusionary network. Um, but simply, the notion of the social contract is an exchange built as an economic structure. So built into the social contract is a set of rules and principles that guides us to be good citizens within the framework of racial capitalism. That in order to have our rights preserved and protected, to have police who will respond to our calls for help, we have to be good citizens of the country we're in. The idea that we have to maintain civility, the idea that if you want a law change, you have to work through the system. Um, all of this is the imposition of a guilt or debt onto all of us to uphold our end of a contract that we never necessarily agreed to. I think that this is important as a rethinking of Charles Mills and the racial contract. So the racial contract is a contractual society that requires the intervention of white men who are positioned as always already political beings. It, as a consequence, assumes that non-whites are restricted from the political space, being judged incapable of forming or fully entering into a body politique. It comes then to structure an entire edifice of thought with respect to Native Americans in the New World or to Africans for whom the racial contract establishes a fundamental partition in the social ontology of the planet. This is a complicated way of explaining something relatively simple. So they don't have an idea of what this criticism of the social contract entails. Yeah. Um, uh, the social contract was built in a sort of Euro American settler, I guess. I think this is the problem of the wrong word, but like, gain advantages, like, mm -hmm. the office free from slavery or be well discriminated. From Native Americans, um, or something like that. Excellent. That's one part of this. So one part of this is that the social contract is not neutral, but instead exists to protect the rights of white people. What does anyone know? What John Locke established as the fundamental aspect of governance in the second treatise on governance, what what right does the government need to protect above others? Yeah. The right to property. And in the context of enlightenment thinkers, who has the right to property? Right, wealthy white men. So if the goal of the social contract, which is the building block, I think even... Your most conservative history teacher would tell you this and agree with you that, you know, when, when Kaveen talks to teachers in Texas who vote for Republicans, they would largely agree that the social contract is the building block of American democracy. That social contract is fundamentally premised explicitly on purpose to protect the rights and privileges of white men, particularly wealthy white men. What is the other side of this argument that's being made? Yeah.
Okay. Well, may, maybe that's true. Like criticize from within, like in order, you have to be someone that it privileges in order to undo it, perhaps. I, I think that it more so has to do with the idea of consent. So the point of the social contract is that we either explicitly or tacitly consent to giving up certain rights for the protection of other rights. What are Charles Mills, Barter, who I quoted, Moton and Harney, what are they saying about this notion of consent in the social contract? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, like, yeah, like Native Americans didn't consent to the European social contract. They were, they were like, they either agreed to live within the norms and rules of civil society or they were murdered. The, the slave had no rights to dispute the social contract. And also, they were created as exceptions of the social contract, carved out and enclosed where the social contract does not apply to the plantation, like very obviously, right? So, so it has to do with consent, the idea that the social contract, the building block of Western democratic ideals is built on the protection of white privilege. So are you with me so far on critique of the social contract? Great. Second, logistics, why we're here. What is logistics? Modern logistics is commercial. It is of the military. It is of profits. It is a permanent war. For Moton and Harney, modern logistics can be traced directly to the slave trade. Uh, the Atlantic slave trade was the birth of modern logistics because it entailed the first global movement of mass commodities. So... Commodities were obviously moved prior to the Atlantic slave trade. There was obviously some degree of global trade, right? There were routes that connected over land to India for spice exchange. There were, you know, trade for silks with China. There were all kinds of things, right? But logistics and the birth of it via the slave trade had two unique features. One, the connection of the globe through shipping and the transatlantic passage or the middle passage. The second is that the commodity that allowed this operation to continue, the commodity that was being bought and sold that was most important for the flourishing of that system of trade were slaves. That modern logistics, modern capitalism is born and created by the need to turn people into commodities to be bought and sold. Uh, and Moton and Hardy write that the slave was worker on the line and at the same time, the supply coming off the line and into the line. And the question of logistics begins by asking, what does it mean when both the worker on the assembly line and the product that comes off the assembly line are the same. A good kind of example of this logistics of the turning of people into commodity and financialization is the story of the Zong. Does anyone know about the Zong? Yeah? Right. Uh, th yes, that's exactly right. Um, and also, when 
the insurance company sued a court declared that there was no distinction between the slaves and the cattle who were on the ship. And obviously, you know, there was no punishment because if slaves are cattle, you cannot be punished for slaughtering your own cattle. Um, and this sort of is an operation of logistics because it has turned people into derivatives based on financial speculation and insurance pools. And Moten and Harney argue that the birth of modern logistical flows, both in terms of finance and in terms of commodity exchange, all comes from this, this initial birth of logistics in the Middle Passage, which the Zong is an example of the financialization of commodities. One of the first examples of, of people turned into explicitly finance. So logis let's think about this a little bit more. What, what can be gained from this insight? Anyone else? Okay, sure. Why not? Um, I mean, it leads to a critique of humanism because um, if people are rendered in as objects, then humanism necessarily can't incorporate them into its lens of empowerment. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. That makes sense. Um, what about positivism and the idea that everything can be logically proven or disproven? The court has used logic to determine that because slaves are indistinguishable from cattle, there's it's fine to, you know, throw them overboard to try to collect insurance money. All of this like logically flows. What they did was the only logical move. It was the most reasonable. Yeah. Uh, it means that the logic that they use to make decisions is embedded with um, neurological biases against black people because these like court rulings of, of the Zong set a precedent that future courts must follow. But if that precedent rules that slaves are not equally like they're not equal, then that is a precedent that like the future must follow on, which means that right. And and way. and what's the American equivalent of this ruling? Or, well, equivalent's the wrong word, but what's a similar, very famous American court case that sets this precedent? Yeah, yeah, like the Dred Scott case. If the way that we think about the law is built on precedent, and that precedent is violent, then what happens to the entire set of rulings that come after that act of violence? They're all beholden to it. They're all beholden to that initial act of logistical violence. The next concept I want to talk through is bad debt. Um, so this one, I'm going to read something. Um, and we're going to, I want to hear from you, get a little more, more engagement on what you think it means. It is not credit that we seek, nor even debt, but bad debt, which is to say real debt, the debt that cannot be repaid, the debt at a distance, the debt without creditor, the black debt, the queer debt, the criminal debt, excessive debt, incalculable debt, debt for no reason, debt broken from credit, debt as its own principle. Credit is a means of privatization and debt as a means of socialization. So long as debt and credit are paired in the monogamous violence of the home, the pension, the government, or the university, debt can only feed credit. Debt can only desire credit. And credit can only expand by means of debt. Yeah, Sabine. Yeah, so... This idea of debt, when the part that you said about the black debt or the queer debt, those are examples of rights that we've given up. Like when you give up your rights, you don't conform to, or like if you're black or queer, then 
those are not like the set of rights the state is gonna, that you've created because the state doesn't allow you to be those. Or what happens when it does? How like what happens when the state says the Defense of Marriage Act is wrong? Gay people should be able to get married. What happens when the state overturns uh, a court ruling that has said black people are not humans or cannot vote? Well, they'll find another way to. Well, let's let's set aside circumvention for a second. What is it when people talk about race in America or rights in America? What what do they say about it in its defense? It, they say. 13th Amendment, Loving versus Virginia, mm -hmm. Congress is possible, and they give examples. What okay, let's take these examples. What what are these examples? What aligns them? Right, but they're rights that are granted by the state. Um, but Loving versus Virginia and the 13th Amendment are doing what exactly? Other had. Right, exactly. And so let's think about this logic of debt. So interracial marriage is illegal. Now it's legal. And it should be celebrated as an example and moment of progress and how great the United States system is. And we should feel honored that we get to live in a society that is self-reflexive and so progressive that there's an imposition of a guilt or debt onto people for being given a right that, or being restored a right that was never granted in the first place that was granted to everyone else. So I think a big problem with the way that Moan and Harney see politics is that most of the time, political progress is almost always done in the name of equalizing a thing that should have never been unequal in the first place. So the idea that Loving vs. Virginia should be celebrated as this big success, the idea that overturning the Defense of Marriage Act is this big success, is kind of a strange takeaway. Anyone else have a thought about this idea? Someone who hasn't talked? Hopefully. Oh, Rhea, what do you think? <laughs> okay. So let's take let's take this gay marriage thing. Someone tells you, you're like, hey, rights are being taken away. The Supreme Court is really messed up. I'm really upset about this. I don't know if you feel that way, but let's say that you do. And someone's like, oh, that's not true. Remember when the Supreme Court granted gay marriage? Clearly, the Supreme Court is progressive and on our side. How do you feel about that response? Yeah, so like celebrating a return to equilibrium is a strange relationship to politics. All right, yeah, Kimmy, what do you think? Yeah, it also means that like if, if you celebrate Supreme Court rulings that grant some people rights that other people already had, it shows that the Supreme Court and other institutions have the ability to gatekeep those rights and they are doing it on purpose. Right. Right. And the whole thing is built in the idea that we should feel indebted to the state for protecting us and celebrate it when it extends those protections. But the very idea that those protections can be extended mean what? They, they can be taken away. They can be circumvented, can be removed. What do we think they mean by bad debt? Why do they seek bad debt? Mm -hmm. um, so most of my party English talking the credit is that the credit is the 
the cutage sort of traces back to what you just said, the idea of financial speculation of um, turning people into derivatives, I guess, mm -hmm. individuals. Um, whereas debt is, or bad debt, is what we owe to one another, what we owe our friends, our family, our community, our allies or accomplices, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, what is the point of debt? Why do people say some debt is good? Have you know? Has anyone heard like acquiring good debt? Has anyone taken? No one's taken like finance classes or like an econ class. So, so like good debt is like when you buy a house, you take out a mortgage from the bank, but that bank has or that that house is your collateral for the debt. And the debt is supposed to accumulate and grow and sort of has a purpose to it. Um, whereas bad debt would be, you know, the like opposite of that debt, debt for debt's sake. Um, and they're kind of playing on credit and debt as oppositional ideas. So they really love to play with oppositionality in some ways. So social contract, anti-social contract policy versus planning, revision versus improvement. We'll get to that a little bit more. Um, okay, so next concept, policy versus planning. Policy versus planning. So what is policy? You all do policy debate. None of you know what policy is? Mandates by the state. Okay. What is the purpose of a mandate by the state? What are its goals? Solve a problem. Excellent. What else does it do? What's your role? If you were going to be a good progressive liberal, what's your role in that policy? Mandate by the state to solve a problem. What is your role? What is your relationship to that mandate by the state to solve a problem? You follow it. Yeah. And maybe even you advocate for it. If it's one that you think is important, like, has anyone ever told you, like, you know, why are you, if you really care about social issues, why are you doing this debate stuff? Why aren't you campaigning, being a good activist? You should join the Democratic Socialists of America. Uh, have you ever heard, like, if you want your values heard, you should vote. Like, I know none of you can vote yet, but I'm, I'm sure you've heard, like, that's how you do it. You vote. You have an obligation to participate in the change that you want to see, right? Yeah, so policy is something in contradistinction to planning. By policy, we mean a resistance to the commons from above. Arrayed in the exclusive and exclusionary uniformity of imposed consensus that both denies and at the very same time destroys the ongoing plans, the fugitive initiations, the black operations of the multitude. As a resistance from above, policy is a class phenomenon because it is the means to advantage in the post Fordist economy, a means that takes the character of politics in an economically dominated structurally by immaterial labor. The economy is powered by the constant insistence on a radical contingency, producing a steady risk for all organic and non-organic forms, a risk that allows work against risk to be harvested indefinitely. For every utterance of policy, no matter its intention or content, it is first and foremost a demonstration of one's ability to be close to the top in the hierarchy of the post-Fordist economy. Thus, every utterance of policy on the radical left is immediately contradiction. A lot going on here. What are we getting out of it? Also, if you have questions about what things mean, feel free to ask. Uh, policies are top down approach that they're based on like, try to fight for an end goal. 
yeah, policies have an end goal. They have a telos. They have a vision for where they want to go. Yeah, Nandana? Mm, resistance from above. Well, think about it. What is what is the from above? Um yes, uh, but resistance from above also means in this kind of top-down model that the idea that the way we should do resistance is by passing policies. So whether that's at a company or in a government, passing legislation and resisting through working through Congress is resistance from above, which is an example of policy. Right, right, exactly. Which is why policy is why that is descriptive of policy. Oh, so the not think that policy is like necessity. Like no, no, they're critiquing policy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Um, they're saying that policy is a legislation of like the agency that we have in our lives, the ability we have to forge relationships, to I guess acquire what we need to I guess live in the world. Whereas planning would be, I guess, the opposite of that. Okay, privatization of agency. Does anyone have an idea of what what that might mean? Does it mean have your agency be privatized? Your use is only determined by how useful you are to the state. Okay, Rhea, what do you think? Yeah, the, and then also that it's like exclusive and not everyone has access to be like a part of that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what... What is kind of an example of what happens to those who don't participate in policy and logistics? What happens? Are there any consequences? Yeah, Rhea, what do you think? I mean, like their voice, I guess, is not heard as much. Like well, more material, more explicit. What happens if you don't if what happens when you violate the social contract? Yeah. yeah, prison. <laughs> right. If you violate the social contract, if you don't participate in policy, if you refuse to participate in the logics of racial capitalism, there are consequences, one of which is jail. What's another one? In what way, specifically? No buzzwords. Like, jail is like a physical thing, but like, it could also just be like, you get, I don't know, like, Okay. What about a thing more people experience? What happens if I say labor is a function of racial capitalism and is exploited by nature, and I'm going to refuse to participate in the process of logistics and labor? What is what does society tell us is the direct outcome of that logic? The you'll be poor. Yeah, poverty. The way that logistical hierarchies, the reason that it is that policies for it are a class phenomenon, particularly in a post-Fordist economy. So post-Fordist meaning an economy that is structured around immaterial labor rather than material labor. So post so Fordism is like the assembly line. Like you wake up, you go to the factory. You, you know, it's like Charlie in the in the chocolate factory, how the dad like screws the cap on the toothpaste, right? That's kind of a joke about Fordism um, is that each person on the assembly line has a menial task they repeat over and over. Immaterial labor is more common now. So like working in the cloud or the service industry or like idea generation, advertisement, right? All of these are immaterial. They don't produce a thing. They don't turn one thing into another thing. Does that, does this kind of make sense? Yeah. So the consequence to not 
participating in the logistics of improvement, of bettering yourself, of doing well in school, going to college, making sure you get a good job, is poverty. It could also be prison. Um, that's less common, but it, it also is a consequence of violating the social contract directly. But yeah, worse medical care. Um food that is less nutritious, living in a food desert, not being able to choose where you live, um, not having heat in your home, living in a place where there's lead in the water and the pipes are corrosive, living in a place where the disaster response time is slow, living in places that are over-policed. All of these are explicitly the consequences of not participating in logistics. Um, sort of, sort of makes sense. Okay. So rules of policy, you all did really well on this. So for Moton and Harney, the rules of policy are one, it fixes others. The move towards capturing deviant socialities into a productive and legible social order reproduces violence from the shoving of mentally ill people into asylums to the necessity to civilize the Indian Policy operates through a pathologization that sustains itself under the guide of neutral helpfulness. In debate, the 1AC might talk about imposed risk of all life, right, like an extinction impact, upon the field of scholarship as a way to drain work through the coercion of risk indefinitely. This produces a constant demand for labor on deviant bodies, criminalizing them if they fail to do this. So this is part of kind of like a framework argument that you might make for this critique. So what about this rule of policy? Rule one, it fixes others. What can we say about this in relationship to debate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kevin, what do you think? It also means uh, policy made its analogous to the social contract, like the 1AC and procedural norms, and needing a brand. Yeah. That you must do. If you don't, you know, you'll be laughed at, you'll be excluded, you won't vote for you. Well, not just that. If you don't participate in those norms, then you're not being productive. You've rendered debate less productive, less helpful. You've, you're bad for clash. You're bad for education. You're being unfair. And also, it is the imposition of, again, a debt or guilt. If the alternative doesn't solve the case and the case solves extinction, the 2AR is going to say that voting negative is condemning people to die. And all of a sudden... It is now your responsibility in this faux role-playing simulation that we've constructed for ourselves. The, their blood is on your hands. Their nuclear war heads will be dropped, and it's your fault. Um, and the sort of inversion of the scales is one that mirrors civil society in the sense that it is the poor's fault for being poor. It is the black person's fault for being black. It is the queer's fault for being queer. And the sort of imposition of social of the social contract onto them and the creation of a set of responsibilities to uphold and defend the state so that the state can defend you, right? That is what framework is all about. So you must uphold and defend debate's norms so that debate's norms can defend you, that it's a social contract. You participate in the topic and read a topical plan debate will reward you with a set of protections it will protect your access to ground it will protect both sides ability to have a fair and limited contestation it will ensure that it takes care of you and over the course of a season you will have third and fourth level testing over arguments you will gain education out of it and so the violation of that contract 
results in a punishment in the same way that the violation of the social contract results in some kind of punishment, which is how it is maintained. And that is sort of like what voting neg in a framework debate does. Does this kind of make sense as a DA2 framework? Yeah. Two, participating in change. Policy demands our participation in change, our hope that things can get better. The 1AC demands that we believe that change is possible, drives out any doubt. Hope moves from the spiritual rhythm of undeniable sociality in the productivity of struggle, action, work, labor, an eternal drive to produce. This is the logic that says that when black folks didn't go to the new clinic in Tulsa because of historic relations with the medical industry, they're to blame for being sick. This is the logic that says that if natives don't want to open up tribal lands to development, they're to blame for being poor. This is the logic of assimilation. How about this? How do we relate this to debate? Rule two, participating in change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, two cents to debate and be like, you really like it. And like, mm -hmm. this debate, you won't have like, so how does that relate to it? Good question. Um, I think that. Uh, while it is true that debate is a voluntary activity, and I think that that is a good response to this, I also think that uh, kind of utilizing the idea of debate as a space for open communication and making arguments about how the way that the topic is selected is a product of logistics that is not necessarily consensual, which like a lot of people have made arguments about. Um, making arguments about why it is good to refuse to be civil. Um, it is good to volunteer to do an activity that is charged with political motivations and policy implication and refuse to participate in the set of pre-established rules as a mode of being ungovernable um, is worthwhile and powerful. Um, debate as a place for testing revolutionary ideals is important. So I think that while your argument makes a lot of sense to me, I think that the the AF or NEG, whoever is reading this argument about logistics, has a, a set of responses to that as well. But that's a great question. Anyone else have an idea of how we ana can analogize participating in change to policy debate? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So wait, I wanna talk about the policy thing. So when you're critiquing policy, are you like also setting new norms that people have to follow too? Or is it saying that like this unethical clinic um has to be accepted? And like what is the consequences for that? Like I'm being considered like like not fitting into like this clinic method. Is that um well, Moton and Harney aren't moral relativists. They think that there are things that are ethical and things that are unethical and think that saying a thing is unethical is, is not inconsistent with anything else that they've said, I don't think. What is, what is your concern about, like, so, like, the AF stands up and says genocide is good. The NEG reads Moton and says, actually, no, genocide's unethical. Is your argument, like, calling a thing unethical means you're judging it? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I guess what I'm getting at is like when you're like quoting like a block that like intend that like obviously excludes certain things and isn't that also like setting norms? Like, Why does it exclude certain things? Because those things are considered like unethical and like more like well, but I don't think why do you, why do you what, so I'm I'm challenging you 
on your use of the word exclude? Why do you think they're excluding a thing? So when they say X is bad, why does that exclude it? Mm -hmm. um interesting i don't i don't necessarily know if i agree with the premise that disagreement is exclusion because like assuming that like we all believe that like Roman society functions based on like their philosophy, then inherently whoever like they're critiquing stuff or like whoever has an idea that doesn't fit their fit within their philosophy would be like excluded because they their ideas are like unethical. Okay. Well two 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 ideas here then. The first is that that's a bold premise. The idea that like the United States will dissolve, return the land to natives, uh, give reparations to black people, no longer capitalism will go away. Um, we will no longer think of logistics as being about improvement, but about revision. And every single, and the social contract will dissolve and all enlightenment values will evaporate. Seems unlikely to be realized. So a part of their theory operates under the assumption that none of these things are likely to change. So like, it, it seems kind of preposterous to me to like even imagine what a society of Moton and Harney would look like because they've like critiqued the notion that a society should be founded on a specific set of principles in the first place. And also it's just like, the government like it would require every single western government to dissolve uh-huh I guess what you're saying about like if it's not if society's not built on like one philosophy, then that like kind of answers what I was saying about Yeah, because I don't I don't think they think that any of their like I don't think that they think any of the things that are they've said is wrong about the world are likely to change. Nor have they prevent presented a way of changing them. They're like not particular like the whole point of this is like the idea that you have an obligation to change situations that are unethical is bad. Um, like you shouldn't feel debt or guilt to change structures that you don't have the ability to change because that's like you know problematic for a lot of reasons not least of which is just like victim blaming um, but it's not like the republic where Socrates is imagining what a perfect society would look like and then having a debate about like what that how that society would be organized they're not really doing what if scenario planning they're just kind of describing a way of relating to the world um and if you ask them how do we get out of logistics they would say what are you what are you talking you like you can't like what you do is you resist um but you don't attach that resistance to an end goal or a telos because to do so is to delude yourself into thinking that the impossible is possible and it creates battle fatigue and, you know, it's depressing, basically. Um, that, like, the activist should not base their success as an activist on whether or not they've successfully changed the things about the world they think should be changed. Instead, the activist, and I think this is the core of their entire work, so the activists should base their success on what happened along the way, on the process, the journey, the friends they made. Kind of like, you know, the, the way that their mode of organizing a refusal didn't participate in the logics of logistics and exclusion that they think are bad and that led them to make new friends and think about the world differently and 
live a life of poetry and that poetry kind of captures the essence of what it means to be human because it doesn't have a point. There's no utilitarian purpose to poetics. It's incapturable. It can't be reduced down to an essence that can be commodified because it just is. I don't know if that helps answer this question. Well, I, I think there is no point is the wrong takeaway. I think instead it is that the point has nothing to do with the end goal. If you spend your whole life working for civil rights and you die and on your deathbed, you're thinking about the fact that many of the injustices you fought against still exist. Do you think it's accurate to say that your life was pointless? I think that's the point of thinking about people yeah so so like i i think that the idea is that for something to be worth investing your time in it needs to have an end goal is what they've criticized that is logistics for moan and harney the idea that everything we do has to have some sort of utilitarian purpose to it is logistics um so this last rule of policy, be productive in your participation. So again, rules of policy are it fixes others participating in change, be productive in your participation. Kind of like challenging the notion that we have to be productive in our participation is also part of the point. Like have any of you ever done a thing and then your parents are like, what is the point of this thing you did? How does this help you in life? And, you're, and the response you wanna tell them is who cares? I had fun, whatever leave me alone. Every time you've ever had that interaction, you've personally experienced this idea. Um, so like going to a park with your friends and hanging out or reading a book because it was fun or writing bad poetry or playing a video game or whatever it is, like it doesn't have a point to it, but it doesn't have to for it to be meaningful. And I think that a core takeaway from all of this is that um however you are you are enough that we're sort of always experiencing this imposition that we have to be something more than we are that we have to fix ourselves and correct ourselves and improve ourselves and i think it is the recognition and the embrace that you as you are are enough and that that is there's, there doesn't have to be another thing, a second step that you could just be who you are and you don't have to change that in order to be worth something um, is I think maybe in terms of how Moten and Harney relate to your life is the most important. And if that means an abdication of responsibility or politics or governance, then their answer to this is, quote, okay, whatever. I will uh, leave you with that.